Chapter Two, My Father, the Falcon. I always knew my father had trouble with words. Sometimes they'd get stuck and he would repeat the same syllable over and over like a record caught in a groove as we all waited for the next syllable to suddenly pop out. He said it felt like a wall came down on his throat. M's, P's, and K's were all enemies lying in wait. I teased him that one of the reasons he called me Johnny was because he found it easier to say than Malala. A stutter was a terrible thing for a man who so loved words and poetry. On each side of the family, he had an uncle with the same affliction, but it was almost certainly made worse by my father, whose own voice was a soaring instrument that could make words thunder and dance. Spit it out, son, he'd roar whenever my father got stuck in the middle of a sentence. My grandfather's name was Raul Amin, and which means honest spirit, and is the holy name of the angel Gabriel. He was so proud of the name that he would introduce himself to people with a famous verse in which his name appears. He was an impatient man at the best of times and would fly into a rage over the smallest thing, like a hen going astray or a cup getting broken. His face would redden and he would throw kettles and pots around. I never knew my grandmother, but my father says she used to joke with my grandfather. By God, just as you greet us only with a frown, when I die, may God give you a wife who never smiles. My grandmother was so worried about my father's stutter that when he was still a young boy, she took him to see a holy man. It was a long journey by bus and an hour's walk up the hill to where he lived. Her nephew, Fazil Hakim, had to carry my father on his shoulders. The holy man called Liwan, saint of the mad, because he was said to be able to calm lunatics. When they were taken in to see the pier, he instructed my father to open his mouth and then spat into it. Then he took some gur, or dark molasses made from sugar cane, and rolled it around his mouth to moisten it with spit. He then took out the lump and presented it to my grandmother to give to my father, a little each day. The treatment did not cure the stutter. Actually, some people thought it got worse. So when my father was 13 and told my grandmother he was entering a public speaking competition, he was stunned. How can you? Raul Amin asked, laughing. You take two or three minutes to utter just one sentence. Don't worry, replied my father. You write the speech and I will learn it. My grandfather was famous for his speeches. He taught theology in the government high school in the village. He was also an imam at the local mosque. He was a mesmerizing speaker. His sermons at Friday prayers were so popular that people would come down from the mountains by donkey or on foot to hear him. My father comes from a large family. He had one much older brother who I call Uncle Khan Dada, and five sisters. Their village of Barkana was very primitive, and they lived crammed together in a one-story ramshackle house with a mud roof, which leaked whenever it rained or snowed. As in most families, the girls stayed at home while the boys went to school. They were just waiting to be married, said my father. School wasn't the only thing my aunts missed out on. In the morning, my father was given a bowl of cream with his tea. His sisters were given only tea. If there were eggs, they would only be for the boys. When a chicken was slaughtered for dinner, the girls would get the wings and the neck while the luscious breast meat was enjoyed by my father, his brother, and my grandfather. From early on, I could feel I was different from my sisters, my father said. There was little to do with my father's little to do in my father's village. It was too narrow even for a cricket pitch, and only one family had a television. On Fridays, the brothers would creep into the mosque and watch and wonder as my grandfather stood in the pulpit and preached to the congregation for an hour or so, waiting for the moment when his voice could rise and practically shake the rafters. My grandfather had a, had studied in India. Where he had been seen, where he had seen great speakers and leaders, including Muhammad Ali, the founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Gandhi, and Khan Abdul Ghaffar, and our great Pashtun leader who campaigned for independence.
Baba, I, as I called him, had even witnessed the moment of freedom from the British colonists at midnight on the 14th of August, 1947. He had an old radio set my uncle still has, on which he loved to listen to the news. His sermons were often illustrated by world events or historical happenings, as well as stories from the Quran and Hadith and sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He also liked to talk about politics. Swa became part of Pakistan in 1969, the year my father was born. Many Swatis were unhappy about this, complaining about the Pakistani justice system, which they said was much slower and less effective than their old tribal ways. My grandfather would rail against the class system, the continuing power of the Khans and gape between the haves and have-nots. My country may not be very old, but unfortunately it already has a history of military coups. And when my father was 18, a general called Zia seized power. He ar arrested our elected prime minister and had him tried for treason and then hanged from a scaffold in jail. Even today, people talk of Mr. Bhutto as a man of great charisma. They say he was the first Pakistani leader to stand up for the common people, though he himself was a feudal lord with vast estates of mango fields. His execution shocked everybody and made Pakistan look bad all around the world. The Americans cut off aid. To try to get people at home to support him, General Zai launched a campaign of Islamization to make us a proper Muslim country with the army as the defenders of our country's ideological as well as geographical frontiers. He told our people it was their duty to obey his government because it was pursuing Islamic principles. Zaya even waited to dictate how we should pray and set up salat or prayer committees. In every district, even in our remote village, and appointed 100,000 prayer inspectors. Before then, laws had um, almost been figures of fun. My father said at wedding parties they would just hang around in a corner and leave early. But under Zaya, they became influential and were called to Islamabad for guidance on sermons. Even my grandfather went. Under Zaya's regime, life for women in Pakistan became much more restricted. Gina said, no struggle can ever succeed without women participating side by side with men. There are two powers in the world. One is the sword and the other is the pen. There is a third power stronger than both, that of women. But General Zaya brought in laws which re reduced a woman's evidence in court to count for only one half of a man's. Soon our prisoners were full of cases like that of a 13-year-old girl who was raped and became pregnant and then went to prison for adultery because she couldn't produce four male witnesses to prove it was a crime. A woman couldn't even open a bank account without a man's permission. As a nation, we have always been good at hockey, but Zaya made our female hockey players wear baggy trousers instead of shorts and stopped women playing sports, some sports altogether. Many of our madrasas or religious schools were opened at that time, and in all schools, religious studies, what we call deniat, was replaced by Islamiat or Islamic studies, which children in Pakistan still have to do today. Our history textbook, textbooks were written to describe Pakistan as a fortress of Islam, which made it seem as if we had existed far longer than since 1947 and denounced Hindus and Jews. Anyone reading them might think we won the, we won the three wars we have fought and lost against our great enemy, India. Everything changed when my father was 10, just after Christmas in 1979. The Russians invaded our neighbor, neighbor Afghanistan, and millions of Afghans fled across the border, and General Zai gave them refuge. Vast camps of white tents sprang up mostly around Peshawar, some of which are still here today. Our biggest intelligence service belongs to the military and is called the ISI. It started a massive program to train Afghan refugees recruited from the camps as resistance fighters. Though Afghans are renowned fighters, Colonel Iam, the officer heading the program, complained that trying to organize them was like weighing frogs. The Russian invasion transformed Zaya from an international 
pariah to the great defender of freedom in the Cold War. The Americans became friends with, one, with us once again, as in those days Russia was their main enemy. Next door to us, the Shah of Iran had been overthrown in a revolution a few months earlier, so the CIA had lost their main base in the region. Pakistan took its place. Billions of dollars flowed into our exequire from the United States and other Western countries, as well as weapons to help the ISI train the Afghans to fight communist Red Army. General Zaya was invited to meet President Ronald Reagan at the White House and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher at 10 Downing Street. They lavished praise on him. Prime Minister Zulfikar was appointed Zaya and his army chief because he thought he was not very intelligent and would not be a threat. He called him his monkey, but Zaya turned out to be very a very wily man. He made Afghanistan a rallying point, not only for the West, which wanted to stop the spread of communism from the Soviet Union, but also for Muslims from Sudan, who saw it as a fellow Islamic country under attack from infidels. Money poured in from all over the Arab world, particularly Saudi Arabia, which matched whatever the U.S. sent, and volunteer fighters, too, including a Saudi millionaire called Osama bin Laden. We Pashtuns are split between Pakistan and Afghanistan and don't really recognize the border the British drew more than 100 years ago. So our blood boiled over the Soviet invasion for both religious and nationalist reasons. The clerics of the mosque would often talk about the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in their sermons, condemning the Russians as infidels and urging people to join the jihad, saying it was their duty as good Muslims. It was as if under Zaya, jihad had become the sixth pillar of our religion on top of the five we grew up to learn. The belief in one God, or prayers, pray, prayers five times a day. Fasting from dawn till sunset during the month of Ramadan, and the pilgrimage to Mecca, which every able-bodied Muslim should do once in their lifetime. My father says that in our part of the world, this idea of jihad was very much encouraged by the CIA. Children in the refugee camps were even given school textbooks produced by an American university, which taught basic arithmetic through fighting. They had examples like if 10 Russian infidels, if out of 10 Russian infidels, five are killed by one Muslim, five would be left, or 15 bullets equals 10 bullets equals five bullets. Some boys from my father's district went off to fight in Afghanistan. It is said that one day, Mulana, Mulana, called Sufi Muhammad, came to the village and asked young men to join him in the fight, to fight the Russians in the name of Islam. Many did, and they set off, armed with old rifles or just axes and bazookas. Little did we know that years later, the same organization would become the SWAT Taliban. At that time, my father was only 12 years old and too young to fight, but the Russians ended up stuck in Afghanistan for 10 years through most of the 1980s, and when he became a teenager, my father decided he too wanted to be a, jihad, a jihadi. Though later, he became less regular on his in his prayers, and in those days, he used to leave home at dawn every morning to walk to a mosque in another village, where he studied the Quran with a senior talib. At that time, talib simply, simply meant religious student. Together, they studied all the 30 chapters of the Quran, not just recitation, but also interpretation, something few boys do. The Talib talked of jihad in such glorious terms that my father was captivated. He would endlessly point out my father to my father that life on earth was short and that there were few opportunities for young men in, the, in our village. Our family owned little land and my father did not want to end up going south to work in the coal mines like many of his classmates. That was tough and dangerous work and the coffins of those killed in accidents would, be, would come back several times a year. The best that most village boys could hope for was to go to Saudi Arabia or Dubai and work in construction. So heaven with, it, with its 72 virgins sounded attractive. Every night my father would pray to God, Oh Allah, please make war between Muslims and infidels that can die in your service and be a martyr. For a while his Muslim identity seemed more important than anything else in his life. He began to sign himself um signed himself with it and spreaded the first signs of a beard. It was, he said, a kind of brainwashing. He believes he might even have thought of becoming a suicide bomber and at the end 
had there been such a thing in those days, but from an early age, he had been a questioning kind of boy who rarely took anything at face value, even though our education at government schools meant learning by rote and pupils were not supposed to question teachers. It was around the time he was praying to go to heaven as a martyr when he met my mother's brother and started mixing with her family and going to her family's gatherings. They were very involved in local politics, belonged to secular national parties, and were against involvement in the war. A famous poem was written at the time by um, the same Pashar poet who wrote the poem about my namesake. He described what was happening in Afghanistan as a war between two elephants the U.S. and the Soviet Union, not our war, and so that we Pashtuns were like the grass crushed by the hooves of the two fierce beasts. My father often used to recite the poem to me when I was a child, but I didn't know what it meant. My father was very impressed by this person and thought he talked a lot of sense, particularly about wanting to end the feudal, the feudal and capitalist system in our country, where the same big families had controlled things for years while the poor got poor. He found himself torn between two extremes, secularism and socialism on one side and militant Islam on the other. I guess he ended up somewhere in the middle. My father was in awe of my grandfather and told me wonderful stories about him. He was all, But he was also told me that he was a man who could not meet the high standards he set for others. Baba was such a powerful and passionate speaker that he could have been a great leader if he'd been more diplomatic and less consumed by rivalries with cousins and others who were better off. In Pashtun society, it is very hard to stomach a cousin being more popular, wealthier, or more influential than you are. And my grandfather had a, my grandfather had a cousin who joined his school as a teacher. When he got the job, he gave his age as much older than my grandfather. And our people didn't know their exact dates of birth. My mother, for example, who doesn't doesn't know when she was born. We tend to remember years by events like an earthquake. But my grandfather knew that his cousin was actually much older than him. He was so angry that he made the day-long bus journey to Mangora to see the SWAT minister of education. Sahib, he told him, I have a cousin who is 10 years older than me. And you have certified him 10 years younger. So the minister said, okay. What shall I write down for you? Would you like to have been born in the year of the earthquake of Quetta? My grandfather agreed. So his new date of birth became 1935, making him much younger than, than his cousin. This family rivalry meant that my father was bullied a lot by his cousins. They knew he was insecure about his looks because at school, the teachers always favored the handsome boys for their fair skin. His cousins would stop my father on his way home from school and tease him about being short and dark-skinned. In our society, you have to take revenge for such slights, but my father was much smaller than his cousins. He also felt he could never do enough to please my grandfather. Baba had beautiful handwriting, and my father would spend hours painstakingly drawing letters, but Baba never once praised him. My grandmother kept his spirits up. He was her favorite, and she believed great things lay in store for him. She loved him so much that she would slip him extra meat and cream off the milk when, while she went out, while she went without. But it wasn't easy to study, as there was no electricity in the village in those days. He used to read by the light of an oil lamp, and one evening he went to sleep and oil lamp fell over. Unfortunately, fortunately, my grandmother found him before a fire started. It was my grandmother's faith in my father that gave him the courage to find his own proud path. He could travel along. This is the path that he would later show me. Yet he was too angry with, with him once. Holy men from a spiritual place called Derry Sedan used our travel, used to travel to the villages in those days begging for flour. One day while his parents were out, some of them came to the house. My father broke the seal on the wooden storage box of maize and filled their bowls. When my grandmother came home, they were furious and beat him. Pashtuns are famously frugal, though generous with guests, and Baba was particularly careful with money. If any of his children accidentally spilled their food, he would fly into a rage. He was an extremely disciplined man and could not understand why they were not the same. As a teacher, he was eligible for a discount on his son's school fees for sports and joining the Boy Scout. 
It was such a small discount that most teachers did not bother, but he forced my father to apply for the rebate. Of course, my father detested doing this as he waited outside the headmaster's office. He broke into a sweat, and once inside, his stutter was worse than ever. It felt as if my honor was at stake for five rupees, he told me. My grandfather never bought him new, new books and said he would tell his best students to keep their old books for my father at the end of the year, and then he would be sent to their homes to get them. He felt ashamed but, ashamed, but had no choice if he didn't want to end up illiterate. All his books were inscribed with other boys' names, never his own. It's not that passing books is, is books on is a bad practice, he says. It's just I so wanted a new book, unmarked by any other students, and brought with my bought with my own father's money. My father just my father's dislike of Baba's frugality made him a very generous man, both materially and in spirit. He became determined to end the traditional rivalry between him and his cousins. When his headmaster's wife fell ill, my father donated blood to help save her. The man was astonished and apologized for having tormented him. When my father tells me stories of his childhood, he always says that though Baba was a difficult man, he gave him the most important gift, the gift of education. He sent my father to the government high school to learn English and receive a modern education rather than, than to... Uh, Madastra, even though as an imam, an imam, people criticized him for this. Baba also gave him a deep love of learning and knowledge, as well as a keen awareness of people's rights, which my father has passed on to me. In my grandfather's Friday address, he would talk about the poor and the landowners and how true Islam is against feudalism. He also spoke Persian and in Arabic and cared deeply for words. He read the great poems of Saadi and Rumi to my father with such passion and fire, it was as if he were teaching the whole mosque. My father longed to be eloquent with his voice that boomed out with no stammer, and he knew my grandfather desperately wanted him to be a doctor, but though he was a very bright student and a gifted poet, he was poor at math and science and felt he was a disappointment. That's why he decided he would make his father proud by entering the district's annual public speaking competition. Everyone thought he was mad. His teachers and friends tried to dissuade him, and his father was reluctant to write the speech for him. But eventually, Baba gave him a fine speech, which my father practiced and practiced. He committed every word to memory while, t while walking in the hills, reciting it to the skies and the birds as there was no privacy in their home. There was not much to do in the area where they lived, so when the day arrived, there was a huge gathering. Other boys, some known as good speakers, gave their speeches, and finally my father called, was called forward. I stood at the lecture, he told me, hands shaking and knees buckling, so short I could barely see over the top, and so terrified the faces were a blur. My palms were sweating and my mouth was as dry as paper. He tried desperately not to think about the treacherous consonants lying ahead of him just waiting to trip him up and stick in his throat. But when he spoke, the words came out fluently like beautiful butterflies taking flight. His voice did not boom like his father's, but his passion shone through. And as he went on, he gained confidence. At the end of the speech, there were cheers and applause. And best of all, he went up to collect the cup for the first prize. He saw my father clapping and enjoying, saw his father clapping and enjoying being patted on the back by those standing around him. It was, he said, the first thing I'd done that made him smile. After that, my father entered every competition in the district. My grandfather wrote his speeches and he almost always came first, gaining a reputation locally as an impressive speaker. My father turned his weakness into a strength. For the first time, Baba started praising him in front of others. He'd, he'd boast. For a while, my father did this, but stopped when he realized that although a falcon flies high, it is a cruel bird. 
Instead, he just called himself Zanadi Yusafzi, our clan name. Ugh. I have such a hard time pronouncing. 